everyone, welcome to this special edition of Vantage. We are coming to you from the Presidential Secretariat in Sri Lanka. Just a short while back, I had an exclusive conversation with the President himself, Ranil Vikramasinghe. He arguably has the toughest job in his country, leading Sri Lanka out of its worst economic crisis. We spoke to him about his policies, cricket and the neighbourhood. What does the President make of China's so-called research vessels? Would he welcome more of them? What is his equation with India's Prime Minister Modi? And does he think Jay Shah runs Sri Lankan cricket? I must say he was surprisingly candid. So this is an interview you don't want to miss. But first up, the headlines. US strikes kill at least five pro-Iranian fighters in Iraq. The precision strikes were carried out in the south of Baghdad. Washington says the strikes were in response to attacks by Iran and its proxies on American forces. North Korea says its spy satellite launch is successful. Their previous two attempts had failed. The US condemns the launch. South Korea partially suspends a 2018 military deal with the North. Japan says it's waiting to verify Pyongyang's claims. Cross-border trade between Pakistan and Afghanistan resumes. This comes after Islamabad suspended its new visa rule. The rule required the crew of commercial vehicles to have passports and visas to enter Pakistan. To protest this decision, Afghanistan halted trade on Tuesday. Dutch voters cast their ballot in a nail-biting election. Prime Minister Mark Rutte has been in power for a record 13 years. Four candidates are vying to replace him. The Netherlands is the EU's fifth largest economy. And founder and CEO of Binance pleads guilty and steps down. This is part of a $4 billion settlement. A settlement deal with the US. Chang Peng Zhao has admitted to violating US anti-money laundering laws. Binance is the world's largest cryptocurrency. We begin tonight with a Vantage interview. Just a short while back, we met Ranil Vikramasinghe, the acting president of Sri Lanka. It's been a year since he took charge. Last year, Sri Lanka was gripped by turmoil. The country was bankrupt. There were shortages of all kinds, from food to fuel. Angry citizens took to the streets. They stormed the president's office. Gotabaya Rajapaksa was president then. He fled Sri Lanka. Ranil Vikramasinghe replaced him to fix things. Today he told us about what the past year was like, whether his country is out of the economic crisis, if China is trying to exploit it, how he sees India's role and his relationship with Prime Minister Modi and cricket, if Jay Shah is running Sri Lankan cricket. Like I said, it's an interview you don't want to miss. Here's a part of that conversation. President Vikramasinghe, welcome to First Post, sir. Thank you. How are you? How have you been? Well, I must say I have survived. You have. I met you in June last year and uh, that's when you would just taken charge. So, how has the last one year been for you? Challenging, but nevertheless we've got through. We've, I think government has established stability. We are handling the economic crisis. We virtually come to the last lap where the all the countries, the creditor nations have to now agree and we are restructuring the economy. We started it. There's interest in Sri Lanka. Tourism is picking up. This month, uh, the Sri Lankan Supreme Court held the Rajapaksas responsible for the economic crisis and I'm quoting from what the court said, their actions, omissions and conduct contributed to the crisis. Do you agree with the view? Well, this is what the court has held. But do you agree? The crisis took place during their time. But the court has not announced any punishment. Do you think they should face the consequences for their actions or at, at the very least apologize? No, the, uh, the crisis took place during their time. If you take it as a sequence from the time, uh, okay, from the time the crisis took place and the delay in going to the IMF and then the resignation of uh, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa when the opposition failed to take it over and then there is again the crisis of uh, July when uh, President Rajap Gotabe Rajapaksa resigned and again the opposition was not willing to take any responsibility it meant the whole system has broken down so the whole politics of this country has been as I would say Topsy-turvy, which has just been uh, 
there were a lot of irresponsible actions by everyone. And yet, so I, I think I, and I think uh, you had to look into all that, not merely one part of it. How the the system had collapsed. You're saying the Rajapaksas alone are not to blame. Rajapaksas have their share of responsibility. Should they apologize for that? I think they have done. Anyway, it's up for them. The, I think President Gotabe had said something about this. Anyway, it, it's up for them. Then when they went off, what would have happened if no one took over the government? Yeah. It would have been worse. So it is basically the whole political system broke down because you are used to giving slogans, trying to keep people happy, and no one was prepared to take a hard decision. You are governing with support from the Rajapaksa's party. Uh, a few days ago, you also attended the birthday celebrations of uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa. Coming back to the critics, they've, they've called you, and I'm quoting, uh, a surrogate of the Rajapaksa's. Uh, what do you say to I, people like these? I have always wished Mahinda Rajapaksa on his birthday, and he has wished me on my birthday. I'm not a surrogate for the Rajapaksa. And his, their party is split. One half is working with the SJB. Other half is with me. This is a unique arrangement. Do you sometimes feel pressure from the party? For, well, on sometimes certain they have their requirement, they come along. Other times they won't. So it, it, it's a sort of a, not a normal parliament. Let's talk about the economy. How is the Sri Lankan economy doing now? Is it out of the woods yet? It's not yet out of the woods. It is coming out of the woods, I would say. Who is Sri Lanka's biggest creditor as of today? Who do you think? You tell me. Huh? I think it's China. It's the international sovereign bonds. That's the biggest. Bilateral creditor? No, bilateral is China, but our biggest creditor is the private. The private creditors, they form the big, largest number. And Among China the, is the biggest bilateral creditor? It's a bilateral, yeah. And yet China has refused to be included in uh, debt restructuring. Why do you think they want to separate? China them? has been in it separately. We negotiate with them separately. It has nothing to do with Sri Lanka or any other countries. It's, they are not satisfied with the terms they are getting from the IMF and the World Bank. They feel that they should have a bigger role to play in the IMF. So they've decided to opt out of it and they're going separately. It's making life more difficult for all of us who are in debt. But this is the reason. It, it's, it has nothing to do with that. It, it's something that has been sorted out by the big boys. Do you believe that Beijing has been an honest broker during Sri Lanka's financial crisis? Yeah, we didn't have any difficulty dealing with them. Do you think India would agree with this assessment? Because India has been trying to bring all the creditors on one platform and China refuses to join it. Yes, we, no, we also suggested one platform. China refused to do it. It's our suggestion. So they did make your life more difficult? I mean, dealing with two groups was not easy. But then the outcome, I think, again, it really, even if it this, uh, even in respect to other countries, this will happen. The message is that China is sending a message to the IMF and others. So it's up for them to sort it out. China has also hinted at expanding the China-Myanmar economic uh, corridor to include Sri Lanka. Is that something that you're keen on? Well, yes, China-Myanmar economic corridor to Sri Lanka and from Sri Lanka to Africa. Does Sri Lanka want to join it? Well, the corridor is there. We'll, we'll get connected. There are no special program on that. But connectivity, yes, we are for connectivity. Also, we are for connectivity with the ports in Africa. So we will connect both the ports in Africa and the Myanmar ports. But what's, what's, what's the issue of Myanmar port? Nothing. China wants to include you in one more project. I wanted to know if you, are, uh, if you welcome it's, that. It's, it's not China. I mean, we are looking at getting integrated and we feel that the African ports are going to be important. I mean, even India knows that. And ships have been coming to, to Sri Lanka as well. Two, two ships came from China in the last one year to but Sri Lanka. But why are you asking me? I mean... No, no, yeah. no. My question is yeah. that those two ships came and the U.S. and India expressed concern and uh, experts said that they were spy ships. Is that a characterization I, you, you know, agree first, with? First one we asked for evidence it's a spy ship. There was no evidence. Second one we had allowed it. We allowed the ship to come and they were in this area. It was not an issue at all. What is a spy ship is, is a big um, question mark. These are civilian ships. But if there are issues, if there are spy ships, we will not allow them to come in. But as far as exploration is concerned, we allow not only Chinese ships, but other ships. But no one highlights the fact that other ships also come to Sri Lanka. Each, each time a Chinese ship comes, we get a lot of publicity. But if a ship, a research ship comes from another country, we are ignored. For example? 
they, 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 they come in right. They, there's a friendship due. So, so we are going to now develop our own hydrography unit and get our own ships. Then we can do surveys in, around India and China both. <laughs> That sounds like a good plan. Yeah. But in the meantime, would you welcome more such research ships from China or would you want Beijing to stop sending no, we them? Will, we will welcome any research ship. We have no problems at all, as long as it's for research. Would you allow China uh, to also dock a military ship in Sri Lanka? We have always allowed. All ships, military ships from any country, they all dock in Colombo. So you're okay with that? Well, they've all been doing, Indians, Chinese, Russians, Americans, everyone comes to Colombo. India's role in Sri Lanka's economic crisis? India helped us, certainly, uh, with the money they gave us. No, no, no two questions about it. Especially Mrs. Uh, Sita Raman was very, very helpful to us. Prime Minister was open. And Mr. Jai Shankar was also focused on it. You've been in leadership roles since the 1990s and the India-Sri Lanka relationship has had its tough moments and good times. Do you think that the relationship is better now uh, than it was some decades ago? From 77, I've been in politics. I first dealt with uh, the government of Moraji Desai and Mr. Vajpayee. Mm -hmm. We got on very well. I had got to know Mr. Vajpayee in 1974 before he became a guest of the Indian government for some time. Uh, we got on. Then under Mrs. Gandhi, it was more strained. <clears throat> but I must say, Rajiv resolved the issues. And uh, from there onwards, we had really uh, fair, good, good relationship with the, with the country. Especially Mr. with Mr. Narasingh Rao. I was, he and I were contemporaries in the education ministry, so I knew him well. And even after retire, when he retired, I used to speak to him and get his advice on politics. We had Mr. Gujral, who again we knew, and Mr. Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh. Mr. Man Do you share with the current Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi? I have known him for a long time, when he was originally a Chief Minister. I know Mr. Modi from that time onwards. Uh, you attended the inauguration ceremony of Mohammed Muizu, the new uh, president of the Maldives yes. and on the very same day he asked India to withdraw troops from his country. What do you make of his India Out campaign? No, Mr. The uh, Indian troops leaving Maldives was a part of the uh, manifesto of the present president. So as usual I presume when he made his first speech he asked for the, he said he was going to fulfill his, uh, I was listening to it, fulfill his requirement of, uh, requi promise to get foreign troops out of Maldives. I, well, uh, I was not surprised that he said that, but that had been a, one of the main items on his campaign. I have not discussed that with him. This is my assessment of it. Do you think this is the right policy decision? Well, for them it is something on which he got elected. I didn't get elected on that. No, I understand, but so, you're, a, you're, you're a veteran of strategic choices. You've seen South Asian politics. Yeah, but <laughs> they've, they've made the choice. But I, looking at the other way, I, I, don't, I think uh, India should not uh, get too worried about it. I, 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 I would say that you should focus more on strengthening our relationships with Maldives. That is the only view I have. India should not, uh, because of this incident, uh, abandon Maldives. I think Maldives needs their help and that's what I understood from the discussions I had with the President that he needs the help of India. He said that to you, that he needs the help of India? He said he needs the help of India. But you did not advise him on this India out policy? No, I mean he, he, he announced it before I met him. What would you have told him otherwise? I would have told him, do it slowly. He might still do it slowly, I mean the fact that he is not going to get it and have do it after discussion. And you can catch that full conversation tonight, right after this show. Now let's talk about the big news from the world of tech. There's been another twist in the Sam Altman saga. The poster boy for artificial intelligence is going back home.
Yes, a tentative deal has been struck, paving the way for Sam Altman's glorious return. His enemies seem to have been vanquished. His friends are rejoicing and his proverbial godfather, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, is breathing a sigh of relief. The story has all the drama in and intrigue of a failed coup. We'll go through it chronologically. Starting with Sam Altman's shock ouster. Last Thursday, he received a message. He'd been summoned by OpenAI's board of directors. He was, he, he was to meet them the following day at noon. The message came from OpenAI's chief scientific officer, Ilya Satskiva. He's one of the co-founders of this company, and he was a member of the board too. Altman had his meeting with four out of five board members on Friday. And that's when he was told that he'd been sacked. Four of the five board members decided on this. One key member, the chairman of the board, was kept out of the loop. That was another OpenAI co-founder, Greg Brockman. After Altman's firing, Brockman was removed from the board. The others knew that he was in Altman's camp, and it seems they were not ready to brook any opposition. But all the board's moves seemed to have backfired. They had a revolt on their hands. Brockman quit in solidarity with Sam Altman. Altman's replacement as CEO, Chief Technology Officer Mira Murati also rebelled. The pressure was mounting. The board agreed to revise course to try and bring Altman back. And they did this on the day they had announced his ouster. It was not a great look. To quell the rebellion, they replaced Murati. They brought in Emmett Shear, the co-founder of video streaming site Twitch. This was on Saturday. And the company had seen three different CEOs in 48 hours. The board shaky house of cards was crumbling. Investors in the startup were furious. They were pushing for Altman's return. OpenAI's biggest investor is Microsoft. The tech giant has given over $10 billion to OpenAI. And CEO Satya Nadella was in firefighting mode. On Sunday, he gave Altman a lifeline. Microsoft hired him and Brockman. They now had jobs at OpenAI's biggest benefactor. Therefore, they had leverage. By Sunday, OpenAI employees were in open revolt. More than 600 of the 750-odd workers threatened to quit. They said they would join Sam Altman at Microsoft. The ousted leader now held all the cards. Both investors and employees were backing him. And yesterday, he began negotiations from his position of power. A few hours ago, OpenAI put out this message, Sam Altman is back. The only thing left is to dot the I's and dash the T's. Altman added his two cents. He thanked Satya Nadella for the support. It's almost as though Altman is thanking him for engineering his return. And Brockman has posted this selfie. It tells you all you need to know. And what of the mutinous board members? All but one have been removed. The sole survivor is Adam D'Angelo, independent board member famous for founding the platform Quora. D'Angelo reportedly switched sides early on, and he's been working to bring Altman back, so it seems he gets to stick around as reward. Another mutineer who later wavered was Ilya Satskiva, the chief scientific officer. But he's off the board, and we'll find out about his ultimate fate in the days to come. The other two board members are out, though. Geosim System CEO Tasha McCauley and Altman's prime nemesis, Helen Toner a director at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technologies. Altman and Toner had been at loggerheads for a while. He wanted her out a few months ago. And this was after she wrote a critical paper on open AI safety practices. It seems Sam Altman finally has his wish. After her removal, Toner put out this message. So it looks like the Altman matter has truly been put to bed. But politics never sleeps, of course. OpenAI has a new interim board. It will be chaired by Brett Taylor, the former CEO, co-CEO of Salesforce. And a surprise inclusion is Lawrence Henry Summers, a 68-year-old economist who served as the director of America's National Economic Council under Barack Obama. The septuagenarian seems like a misfit on this board of young tech hotshots. But perhaps his old government contacts can help the company's expansion plans. So that's how things currently stand. Sam Altman's victory is complete. The interim board will decide on their successors soon. And Altman will likely have a seat at the table, as will his loyalists. But is there a greater role for Microsoft on the cards? Satya Nadella was instrumental in arranging this outcome. He put out this message after news of Altman's return went public. He talks about more stable, well-informed, and effective governance. How much of this governance will be under his guidance? 
One thing is for sure, Microsoft and Nadella will leave their mark on the revamped open AI. Here's another story we've been tracking closely, the turmoil in Myanmar. It is going from bad to worse. More than two years back, the military junta in Myanmar pulled off a coup. The generals removed the democratically elected government and they reigned supreme, largely unchallenged. In the past three weeks, though, the picture has changed. Rebels are fighting soldiers and defeating them. They're gaining ground. Things are so intense that New Delhi is now concerned. India has released a travel advisory asking citizens to avoid non-essential travel to Myanmar, meaning if it's not very important, avoid going there. What about the Indians who are already there? Well, they've been asked to be careful, take precautions, avoid traveling to troubled areas and register with the Indian mission in Yangon. And how many Indians are there in Myanmar? Not very many. According to one claim, there are just 2,000 odd Indians in the country, but there are significant Indian investments at stake here. India is involved in more than a dozen infrastructure projects in Myanmar. The most significant one is the Sitwe port. This is a deep water port. It was built by India in Myanmar's Rakhine state. The project is worth over $400 million. Before this offensive, bilateral trade was also expanding. It had grown to $1.5 billion. And then there is foreign invest investment. Almost $2 billion have been invested from India into Myanmar. The rebel offensive puts all of these investments at risk. And this advisory is a signal, an official acknowledgement of the trouble brewing in the country. The losses are mounting for the military. So far, they've taken control of over 100 outposts. The rebels have taken control. Two days ago, there was another major offensive. Again, the rebels came out on top. They captured 18 soldiers and 40 weapons, 4-0. The momentum is with the rebels. Their offensive has been swift and effective, and the military looks helpless. A few days ago, there was talk of a counter-offensive, but it's yet to take shape. The military has conducted some airstrikes, but they haven't been able to stop the rebels. The lost territories are yet to be reclaimed. And the troops are surrendering in large numbers without putting up a fight. Let me show you some numbers from last week. Since the rebels began their offensive, more than 400 soldiers have surrendered. They belong to the military and the police force. Reports say they also gave up their weapons. So the troops seem to be reluctant to fight. In some cases, it's, it's quite obvious. The rebels have released some pictures of soldiers who've recently surrendered. The rebels say they gave travel expenses to these soldiers. They allowed them to return to their families. And if these claims are true, the military is in serious trouble. This would mean that their troops have lost faith in the generals. They're choosing money over fighting, and the rebels are happy to pay them off. Those who did not get any protection tried to flee, many ending up in India. In the last few weeks, at least 70 soldiers from Myanmar have come to India, and this is the official figure, so there could be more undetected ones. They entered through the northeastern states of Manipur and Mizoram. New Delhi managed to send them back. But as long as this offensive continues, the risk of a bigger influx remains. Experts say Myanmar's military faces an existential crisis. Clearly, things are no longer sustainable for the Myanmar army. At some point, it's either going to have to give up very significant parts of, of territory, um, or it might even be pushed to potentially make even bigger concessions. Um, so um, the Myanmar military, I think, is, is facing an existential crisis at this point. The writing is on the wall. If the military loses control of Myanmar, the border with India could become more vol volatile, with more refugees probably showing up. It's a crisis that India cannot afford to ignore. Now to the big headline from West Asia, a breakthrough finally, a pause in the Israel-Hamas war. Looks like diplomacy finally came through. They have what they're calling a two-phase deal. In the first phase, Hamas will free 50 Israeli hostages, just women and children. In exchange, Israel will free 150 Palestinian prisoners, again, just women and children. All this will happen over a period of four days. And in these four days, there will be no fighting. So basically, a four-day pause in the war. Israel will also allow 300 aid trucks into Gaza. More fuel will enter the Strip. So this is what we have as part of the first phase. A prisoner exchange, a pause in fighting, and more aid for Gaza. It sounds like good news. But for the families of the hostages, it's also a period of uncertainty. They do not know who will be released in this phase. And this suspense can be agonizing. When I heard this uh, solution that uh, the government uh, make with Hamas, I feel so disappointed. 
because I don't know if my galley will be with this list that will go, go home. And I want her as soon as possible. And this feeling, maybe it's not, will be, it's make me very sad in this moment. Any person who will be released is good, is important. Uh, eventually we need them all. But if the, it's had to be slice by slice, so be it. Then we have phase two of the deal. This is where things get complicated. In the second phase, Hamas can release more hostages. They haven't given a definite number, but Israel says for every 10 hostages released, there will be one day pause in fighting, a one day pause. So if they release more hostages, the pause will be longer. If they release no one, the fighting will resume. So basically the ball is in Hamas's court. If they want the fighting to stop, they will have to release people. So for the second phase, the onus is on Hamas. That is the deal. Now let's look at the diplomacy behind it. It's been in the works for quite some time now. Four main parties were involved. Israel, Hamas, the United States and Qatar. The small Gulf state of Qatar was acting as mediator, playing what has been called an outsized role in brokering this deal. And we can see why. Qatar shares good relations with Hamas. Its political leaders live in Doha. Qatar is also a close ally of the US. So its role as mediator was not surprising at all. As for the United States, it is also said to have played an active role not least because its own citizens have been held as hostages. So the Biden administration has a direct stake in this. 10 US citizens, at least 10, are believed to be held hostage by Hamas. Plus, you cannot overstate the importance of a pause right now. More than 14,000 people have died in Gaza, more than 14,000. This, there is no electricity, no water, no food. Hospitals are overwhelmed and the death toll is only rising. For the Gaza Strip, this is a life-saving pause. The question is, when will it begin? Reports say it could start as early as 10 a.m. local time tomorrow. Qatar says an announcement will be made within the next 24 hours. It also hopes this pause will pave an end to this war. But Israel disagrees. It says this pause is not the end of the war. Listen to this. There is idle talk outside, as if after the truce, to return our abductees, we will stop the war. So I would like to make it clear, we are at war and we will continue the war. We will continue the war until we achieve all our objectives, eliminate Hamas, return all our abductees and missing persons and ensure that there will be no element in Gaza that threatens Israel. And while fighting may pause in Gaza, across West Asia tensions are escalating. Yesterday, the US carried out airstrikes in Iraq. Their targets were Iranian proxies. They've been striking American forces. They've launched more than 60 attacks in the past 50 days. So this was tit for tat. And in the last 48 hours, such counter strikes have escalated. Iranian proxies target American troops and bases. The US hits back with more force. This has raised fears of a wider conflict. So while Gaza may get some relief, West Asia remains on the brink of a larger war. Now let's turn our gaze slightly northward to borderlands between Asia and Europe. Tensions are spiking in the Caucasus again between Azerbaijan and Armenia. These two nations have been enemies since the fall of the Soviet Union. They've been fighting over a disputed region known as Nagorno-Karabakh. This September, Armenia had a resounding victory. And since then, there's been a tenuous peace in the region. But now, Baku is accusing Paris of destabilizing the region. The Azeri president spoke yesterday and he did not mince any words. France is playing a very destructive role in the Southern Caucasus. Actually, uh, Armenia became a puppet of uh, French government now. And uh, this can be a serious uh, threat to regional stability. To understand his ire, we need to understand the Caucasus conflict. Armenia and Azerbaijan have been at each other's throats for decades. They fought two major wars since the 1990s, but the world has not really bothered to try to resolve the issue because of history and geography. Both Azerbaijan and Armenia are former Soviet states. They still fall in Russia's sphere of influence. So the rest of the world had mostly left them to fight it out amongst themselves. After all, who would meddle with Russia's neighbors in its backyard? It seems the answer to that question is France. 
Paris has been courting Armenia lately, especially this year. It's been a tough year and a tough few months for Armenia. It seems to have decisively lost Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. The region was internationally recognized as Azeri territory, but it was home to mostly ethnic Armenians. Now, they did not acknowledge Azerbaijan's authority. They maintained de facto independence with help from neighboring Armenia. All that ended in September. Azeri forces captured the entire disputed region, and this led to the flight of more than 100,000 ethnic Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh. They fled to Armenia. And Armenia and its Prime Minister, Nikol Pashinyan, were helpless to prevent any of this. Their traditional partner in the region, Moscow, was busy. Russia's war in Ukraine has left it little time to deal with other matters, so there's been a void in the old Soviet backyard, and France has been looking to fill that void. For months, French President Emmanuel Macron has been cozying up to Armenia. He's been sending ministers to the region regularly, and all of them have been lobbying for Armenia at international forums, trying to bring in aid and supplies for the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. And this has continued even after Azerbaijan's victorious offensive. Armenia's Prime Minister Pashinyan was in Paris just a few days ago for President Macron's pet diplomacy project, the Paris Peace Forum. So Paris definitely has long-term plans for the Armenians. But these are not necessarily peaceful plans. In the defense field, protecting your sovereignty and protecting your people, the French Republic, in the name of these values and in the name of the special bond that unites our two countries, we are very pleased to be able to see these contracts signed today and this defense cooperation become a reality. Today, our cooperation includes the modernization of defense capabilities of the Republic of Armenia's armed forces, the education and training of personnel, the exchange of experience, advisory support in the field of reforms, the armed forces and a number of other priority areas. Long-term defense contracts, long-term military training agreements, French advisory support. These deals were announced in late October. Obviously, Azerbaijan is not pleased. And all this has led to the outburst yesterday. The Azeri president said, and I quote, France destabilizes not only its past and present colonies, but also our region, the South Caucasus, by supporting separatist tendencies and separatists. By arming Armenia, it implements a militaristic policy, encourages revanchist forces in Armenia, and prepares the ground for the start of new wars in our region. It's a stinging indictment and a stern warning. If France is not careful, another war may erupt in the Caucasus. Ten days, more than 200 hours, that's how long 41 workers have been trapped in a tunnel in India's Uttarakhand. These men were building the tunnel. On 12th November, a part of it caved in due to a landslide. None of the workers was injured, but all 41 have since been trapped. The government has tried several rescue missions, including drilling into the tunnel, but nothing has worked until now. Our next report tells you how India is racing against time to rescue these workers. November 12th, it was just another day for these workers. They were building the Silkyara Tunnel. This is in the North Indian state of Uttarakhand. It looked like business as usual, but their fate changed in just minutes. A landslide caused heavy debris to fall on the tunnel. The tunnel caved in and these 41 men were trapped. Thankfully, none of them was injured, but they've been trapped for over 200 hours now. So, how are they surviving? When the tunnel collapsed, mounds of debris cut off oxygen supply, so authorities had to work fast. They used a pipeline that was supplying water to the tunnel. The same pipeline was used to provide oxygen, food and water to these workers. On November 21st, the first video emerged of the trapped workers. They were seen peering into the lens of an endoscopic camera. Many of them were seen with hard hats on. They also received their first cooked food, a humble meal of khichri. Officials say the workers are in good spirits, but their families remain worried about their health. When we talk to the trapped workers, it could be inferred from the conversation that they are in a state of good mental health and are motivated. 
they are saying that they are holding ground and there is no problem. We wanted to tell you that sufficient quantities of food have reached them. Which brings us to the rescue plan. What does it look like after 10 days? The plan itself is simple. A drilling machine will cut a passage through the debris. A pipe, almost 3 feet wide, will be pushed through this passage. Trapped workers will then crawl out through this pipe. But while it may sound easy, the execution itself is quite difficult. The drilling process has faced a lot of obstacles, like loose soil and even more falling debris. Plus, there's the challenging Himalayan terrain, so authorities have to go slow or else more parts of the tunnel can cave in. We're going to make sure it's safe, we're making sure they get out alive, we're making sure the rescuers are safe. As for how long it takes, everyone here agrees we want the men out safe and the rescuers safe, and that's as, that's as long as it takes. However, authorities remain optimistic. They say the workers will be out in a few days. But for their families, the wait is excruciating. They are watching the tunnel entrance every minute, hoping to receive some good news soon. Now let's turn our attention to Africa, to the country of Zambia in the southeast. It's a landlocked country of about 20 million people and currently it's struggling to deal with a debt crisis. Zambia is not one of the wealthiest nations in the world, so it's been working to try and improve its economy. But there's a catch. Their recent growth was fueled by international debt, unsustainable debt. Zambia eventually defaulted in 2020 and has been struggling to restructure that debt ever since. But this week, they faced another setback. A creditor committee to oversee the restructuring rejected its plans, sending it back to the drawing board. Who were these stern creditors that rejected Zambia's plan? You're talking about debt in Africa, so the committee obviously features China. Our next report has all the details. Always be careful when you take a loan, because there's a thin line between a bank and a loan shark. This statement holds true whether it's an individual or a country taking a loan as some countries are finding out. This week, it was Zambia that felt the pinch. Its creditors rejected a proposed debt restructuring plan, and that sent a jolt through the country's already struggling economy. Zambia is heavily in debt, so much so that it was forced to default on its loan obligations back in 2020. That year, Zambia's debt was worth $32.8 billion. Over $18 billion of that was foreign debt owed to a variety of lenders. You have the usual global lenders, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Then there were loans taken from the open market through financial instruments like dollar-dominated government bonds. These are known as euro bonds. Zambia borrowed about $3 billion using this financial instrument. And then, of course, there are the bilateral loans, loans issued by foreign nations. For Zambia, like for many other African nations, the largest bilateral lender is China. Beijing is usually secretive about its loans, but Zambia owes China at least $4 billion. We know this because of Zambia's efforts to restructure its debt over the past few years. After defaulting in 2020, Zambia asked for help. Its creditors got together to work out a loan restructuring plan. In June 2022, these bilateral creditors got together to form an official creditor committee. The members include South Africa, France and China. This group worked on restructuring $6.3 billion worth of Zambia's bilateral debt. And that's when it emerged that $4 billion was owed to China. This means that without China's go-ahead, no restructuring is possible. This June, the committee made a breakthrough on that $6.3 billion tranche. It was considered revolutionary, so much so that the IMF wanted to use that as a template for other nations that had defaulted. This is a breakthrough because of the way the structure of uh, the agreement is being uh, done. And uh, I very much look forward to codifying Zambia and then using it as uh, a model for other. Zambia was ecstatic. They were thanking the official creditor committee for their help. The debt restructuring that we have attained at this time, we really would like to, think, to thank the co-chairs, um, China and France. But on Monday, the same committee created a roadblock. 
Zambia was trying to restructure its 3 billion euro bond debt. It had a plan. The IMF was ready. The markets were ready. But the bilateral creditors weren't. They rejected Zambia's proposal. Why? Because the bondholders weren't making enough of a loss. The committee chaired by China and France wants a different deal. One where euro bondholders make a larger loss than Zambia's government or the IMF deem necessary. The logic was, if I've taken a haircut, so must everyone else. It seems petty. And Zambia has no choice but to listen. This creditor committee has a veto on any deal Zambia tries to make. Confidence in Zambia's economy has been shaken. The value of its bonds has fallen. And not just Zambia, other nations trying to restructure their debt are being seen as a risk, like Ghana and Sri Lanka. It's a chain reaction hurting already battered nations, leading to a vicious cycle of debt and poverty. Now let's shift our attention back to India. When the pandemic came, India's healthcare industry was thrust into the teeth of the storm. There were many challenges, including affordability, shortage, and access. The gathering storm reordered the industry, but most of all, it had one ominous consequence. Medical inflation shot up tremendously. Now, the Wuhan virus has subsided, but healthcare costs have not come down. Medical inflation is still soaring. A new report is out. It says India's medical inflation stands at 14%, more than twice as high as the retail inflation. It is also the highest medical inflation in Asia, more than that of other countries with high medical cost trends, like China, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And medical inflation affects everything from the cost of medicines to medical treatments and procedures. For instance, India's cost of hospitalization has more than doubled in the last five years. And this is a cause for concern because medical inflation erodes family savings. It chips away at reserves for emergencies. Let me show you how. 55% of all hospitalizations in India are financed through household savings. 23% are done through borrowings. Some borrow through credit cards and loans. Some sell family gold. So the situation is dire. And this is why people avoid seeking medical care. 59% Indians skip their annual health checkups. 90% neglect regular doctor consultations. People push tests and procedures aside. They wait for symptoms to get worse, which only drives up the costs. And every year, 7% Indians are pushed below the poverty line because of this, solely because of medical bills. In fact, in 2018, 55 million Indians were pushed into poverty because of medical bills. This is cruel and unfair beyond measures. But it is no wonder. Because nearly 70% of health costs are paid by citizens out of their pockets. This involves both rural and urban areas. 82% of urban households are not covered under health insurance. Even with insurance, problems persist. For starters, patients continue to pay out of their pockets because most insurers do not cover all expenses, like those of medical aids used during surgery. And secondly, medical insurance premiums, or the amount paid for an insurance policy, they've grown steadily. They rose by 10 to 25% over the last one year. In fact, health insurance claims have been growing faster than medical inflation. In the last five years, average claim for infectious diseases rose by 160%. For cataract treatment, the claim rose by 54%. And that's not all. Treatment costs are also escalating fast. So an average health coverage is inadequate in every five years, especially for those who depend on their corporate covers because companies buy a group coverage where the cost remains stagnant, despite the increase in cost of medical treatments. And this is a multifaceted problem, but the result is as uncomplicated as it gets. Medical inflation is burning a deep hole in people's pockets. It is taking, a, taking an immense emotional toll, and it can't be business as usual. This is healthcare we're talking about. Employers need to do better. India has a workforce of 522 million people. Of this vast landscape, only 15% receive health insurance support. The government also needs to step in. The burden of healthcare expenses is disproportionately affecting India. This is a race we do not want to win. It's a policy issue. It's not a personal finance problem. Every citizen has the right to health. So how long before they aren't? one hospitalization away from financial ruin. 
When someone says vampire, what is it that comes to your mind? If you love English literature, maybe Bram Stoker's Count Dracula. If you love teenage angst, then Edward Cullen. No judgment here. But let me tell you about another kind of vampires. Thousands of light years away from us, I'm talking about vampire stars. They get the name because they drain the life from their companion stars by feasting on them like a vampire. Science has known this for a while now. But now a new study is out. It says a third hidden star is involved in this equation. And this could change everything we know about how stars evolve. Our next report tells you more. For scientists, social interaction is always intriguing, whether it's on Earth or in space. Yes, space is full of cosmic relationships. We aren't talking about aliens here, but stars. Many stars tend to live in pairs. More than half the stars in the sky have a partner. But then being single is great too. And stars know this. So many prefer being alone, like the sun. But then there are some stars who don't fit into either of these well-behaved categories. Some stars are insidious and parasitic. They'd rather be in a situationship, if you know what we mean. Like the BE stars, which are fondly and appropriately called vampire stars. These stars were discovered over a century ago, but much of their existence remains a puzzle. Here's what we know so far. These stars can be several times the size of our sun. They spin very fast. This motion attracts gaseous materials towards them, which turns into a superheated belt of spinning material that the star fashionably wears in its midsection. It sounds kind of cool, but this is also the scary part. This gaseous belt the star so fondly dons is actually made up of other stars, and that's where the vampire bit comes in. A vampire star attracts other smaller stars, then devours their atmospheres. It rips through them with its speedy spinning motion. It drains the star and sucks it in, then collects the material in its gaseous disk. So if you thought you were in a toxic relationship, think again. This star is literally devouring its companions and wearing their corpse with a sadistic fashion sense. But that's not all. A new study is out. It says these stars might have helpers, kind of like wing persons. The study says vampire stars aren't working alone. There are hidden, traitorous stars that push other stars towards the vampires, supplying the vampire stars with victims to dine on. So vampire stars may thrive in triple star systems. Experts say this study could be a breakthrough in stellar physics. It can help us understand how stars die, which in turn will contribute to the study of how black holes are formed. All in all, it can help solve a number of cosmic mysteries and help us know more about stellar sucking vampires. After all, in the case of vampire stars, it seems three's a company and not a crowd. And finally, it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Australia, World Cup winning Captain Pat Cummins gets an underwhelming welcome. The Indian Navy successfully tests Brahmos missile from a warship and a Brazil-Argentina match descends into chaos as police clash with fans at a sold-out Maracana stadium. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, 1963, U.S. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. The 46-year-old was shot during his Texas campaign. The president had asked about the weather earlier in the day and opted not to have a top on the limousine. The bullet hit his head while the motorcade passed through the city. His car raced to the hospital, but they could not save the 36th American president. That's all we have for you today. We're wrapping up from Colombo. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. A warm welcome. He presents Mrs. Kennedy with a bouquet of red roses. now turning on to Elm Street and it will be spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trademark. But just a moment, we have a bulletin coming in. We now switch you directly to Parkson Hospital and KBOX like News Director. Women here in shock, some have fainted. Grown men, Secret Service men standing by.
minutos de mierda son los cagones. ¡Cagones! President Vikram Singh, welcome to First Post, sir. Thank you. How are you? How have you been? Well, I must say I have survived. You have. I met you in June last year and uh, that's when you just taken charge. So, how has the last one year been for you? Challenging, but nevertheless we've got through. We've, I think government has established stability. Mm -hmm. We are handling the economic crisis. We virtually come to the last lap where the, all the countries, the creditor nations have to now agree and we are restructuring the economy. We started it. There's interest in Sri Lanka. Tourism is picking up. Would you say you have the toughest job in your country? What? You have the toughest job in your country? Well, I think so, but others think they have the toughest job. Maybe my... <laughs> A team in the treasury may be having a tougher job than me. They've what? got to get the figures correct yes. for me to carry on. <coughs> and the figures are challenging. I'll come to that. But what is the most difficult part of your job sir, as president of Sri Lanka? No, first was to make the country realize the problems we are facing and say that I had no magic wand and had nothing to give. I could only ask, I had only to request that they may have to bear up this pain for some more time. But I'll give whatever relief I can. That I think is the most difficult job I had. Yes, and most politicians would not say that, that I have nothing to give and you have to suffer the pain. Well, I could give them hope and I could give them a better future. But we had to go through a difficult time to get through that. When you took over, there was complete chaos. There was a sort of Sri Lanka was bankrupt, there was total collapse, your own home came under attack. How did you go about restoring it and are things in order, personally as well as, uh, you know? Firstly was to ask the security forces to uh, establish law and order, not to allow rioting. They tried, they took over the Prime Minister's office, <coughs> from which I was operating, since this building was taken over earlier. Then they attempted to take over the... Hmm, Parliament, at which stage I thought enough is enough, and I ordered the army to take any measure possible necessary to safeguard Parliament. From that time onwards, we decided that we are going to enforce law and order. There was a big outcry, people said we are violating human rights, uh, but finally we had stability. Did you ever think that it would come to this, that the presidential office would be run over, that your own home would come under attack? Well, we never thought this could happen, but in the last uh, month or so, things were sort of, uh, I would say, things were hotting up. Then on May 9th, but the taking of the office took, uh, was thereafter. This month, uh, the Sri Lankan Supreme Court held the Rajapaksas responsible for the economic crisis. Mm. And I'm quoting from what the court said, their actions, omissions and conduct contributed to the mm. crisis. Do you agree with the view? Well, this is what the court has held. But do you agree? The crisis took place during their time. But the court has not announced any punishment. Do you think they should face the consequences for their actions or at, at the very least apologize? No, the uh, the crisis took place during their time and then when Mahinda Rajapaksa, the Prime Minister, gave up, the President then called on the opposition leader to form a government, which is a normal practice. And in this case, the opposition leader should have taken over because he had the backing of the government. They ducked it. The whole political system collapsed. There was no one willing to take responsibility. So, finally, if you take it as a sequence, from the time 
okay from the time the crisis took place and the delay in going to the IMF and then the resignation of uh, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa when the opposition failed to take it over and then there is again the crisis of uh, July when uh, President Rajap Gotabaya Rajapaksa resigned and again the opposition was not willing to take any responsibility it meant the whole system has broken down so the whole politics of this country has been as I would say topsy-turvy which has just been uh, there were a lot of irresponsible actions by everyone and yet so I, I think I, and I think uh, you had to look into all that, not merely one part of it, how the, the system had collapsed. So you're saying the Rajapaksas alone are not to blame? Rajapaksas have their share of responsibility. Should they apologize for that? I think they have done. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's up for them. The, the, I think President Gota had said something about this. Anyway, it, it's up for them. Then when they went off, what would have happened if no one took over the government? It have been worse. So it is basically the whole political system broke down because you are used to giving slogans, trying to keep people happy and no one was prepared to take a hard decision. Right. So that's, you have, you have to look, look in that background, you see this whole system collapsed. Not once but twice. A few so days. If, if you look into that, yeah. I mean the record is not good for anyone. As far as uh, President Rajapaksa and the Prime Minister Rajapaksa are concerned, they were there at that time, but it, it was a process that started. And let's say that he, they left office. What would have happened if uh, what would have happened if the opposition was not willing to take over and I was not there? Yes. Uh, that sounds like a fair argument to me, but uh, your critics, I'm assuming, would construe it as defense of the Rajapaksas. I'm if not you... defending the Rajapaksas. I'm saying Rajapaksas are responsible. But then there are no one else to take responsibility thereafter. The critics are the ones who ran away. You're governing with support from the Rajapaksas party. Uh, a few days ago, you also attended the birthday celebrations of uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa. Uh, Coming back to the critics, they've, they've called you, and I'm quoting, uh, a surrogate of the Rajapaksas. Uh, what do you say to I, people like this? I have always wished Mahinda Rajapaksa on his birthday, and he has wished me on my birthday, and I've uh, been there. This time, Mr. Nama Rajapaksa asked whether I could come to his house. He was having a party. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, I mean, if any member of parliament invites me and you have the time, I go for the birthday party. Otherwise, we... Uh, sometimes we get the cake down and cut it in the parliamentary group meeting or at cabinet. That's the that's tradition. I mean, it's, it's nothing new. I'm not a surrogate for the Rajapaksas. I mean, his, their party is split. One half is working with uh, the SJB. Other half is with me. If you ask me, is the whole of Rajapaksas party supporting me? No. And if you ask me, is the whole of the SJB supporting Sajid Premadas or no? All parties are split. So it looks as if uh, I just ask people to get together to pull the country out. And I got this majority. If I didn't have the numbers, what would have happened? This is a unique arrangement. Do you sometimes feel pressure from the party? For, no, on sometimes issues? they have their requirement, they come along. Other times they won't. So it, it, it's a sort of a, not a normal parliament. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk about the economy. How is the Sri Lankan economy doing now? Is it out of the woods yet? It's not yet out of the woods. It is coming out of the woods. I would say we've finished everything. Uh, okay, we, we, we are able to meet the benchmarks that the IMF has put, but still two issues are there. One, we still have to be, uh, balance the budget. Uh, secondly, is a question of the trade balance, which is not in our favour. As far as the domestic budget is concerned, we have to increase our revenues. It's partly affected by the fact that we have a, uh, our revenue collection machinery is not updated. We've always focused on a few. <coughs> Secondly, the economy has not picked up. That's also another reason for affecting the revenue. But I think 2024, 25, 25 onwards, 
it will be better but we can't go on as this traditional way we have to have a new economy and that's what we are planning for and going ahead one of your biggest expenses is servicing the debt but uh, sri lanka has not been able to generate the kind of revenue they need to do no. that how do you plan to meet your debt obligations then no we have to uh, depend more on our revenue mm. we must we have to get the economy grow much faster which means uh, restructuring the economy removing away the remaining fetters to growth right uh, in september the imf uh, withheld uh, new funds uh, after a review uh, how do you plan to unlock the remainder of the bailout so we fulfill what has to be done so there shouldn't be a problem i am we met the imf targets benchmarks to use the word president vikram singhe who is sri lanka's biggest creditor as of today pan who is sri lanka's biggest creditor as of today who do you think you tell me Huh? I think it's China. It's the international sovereign bonds. That's the biggest. Bilateral creditor? No, bilateral is China, but our biggest creditor is the private. And the private creditors, they form the big, largest number. And China Manga is the biggest bilateral creditor. It's a bilateral here. Yeah. And yet China has refused to be included in uh, debt restructuring. Why do you think they want to separate? China debt? has been in it separately. We negotiate with them separately. They nothing do with Sri Lanka or any other countries. It's they are not satisfied with the terms they are getting from the IMF and the World Bank. They feel that they should have a bigger role to play in the IMF. So they've decided to opt out of it, and they are going separately. It's making life uh, more difficult for all of us who are in debt. But this is the reason. It, it's had nothing do with us. It, it's something that has been sorted out by the big boys. But China is stalling the IMF relief that Sri Lanka so does. No, China. Means. China has now agreed. They sent in their letters mm -hmm. of consent, and we have conveyed to the other the content of their letter. Well, it was sent in confidence to us. We requested China also to uh, give copies to the other members. China is often called a loan shark, and over the past few months, they played hardball with Sri Lanka as well. did you at at some point feel that that you were dealing with a loan shark i was i won't say it's a loan shark we we knew they were going to play it separately and differently but i also knew that with the others responding china was also going to give a similar response and i agreed to meet i wanted to meet with president z which they agreed at the belt and road it was it was not an easy thing to negotiate the tree structuring among international geopolitics but that's what happened you met him in october what did you tell him hmm? i discussed by that time he i spoke to the others he said no we we will be uh, sending you our requirement where our consent so being going to details we had already discussed it but i must uh, say i i first we appreciate india 3 and a half billion dollars that was given uh, that was useful Secondly, the other countries helped us and the multilaterals. I will uh, come to the role of India, but do you believe that uh, Beijing has been an honest broker during Sri Lanka's financial crisis? We didn't have any difficulty dealing with them. Do you think in India would agree with this assessment? Because India has been trying to bring all the creditors on one platform, and China refuses to join <coughs> it. Yes, yeah, well, no. We also suggested one platform. China refused to do it. It's our suggestion. So they did make your life more difficult. I mean, dealing with two groups was not easy, but then the outcome, I think, again, will be even if it this uh, even in respect other country, this will happen. The message is that uh, China is sending a message to the IMF and others, so it's up for them to sort it out. But what is the message Sri Lanka taking from this episode? No, Is it with China? Pan? No, we know that China has now cooperated and they've given their uh, positive answer. Sri Lanka is also an active member of the Belt and Road project yes. uh, but uh, Chinese funding has gone down until 2019 they were uh, investing some 100 billion dollars every year now mm. it's come down to uh, 60 or to 70 billion dollars uh, yet you heap praise uh, on the BRI the Beijing summit what do you think uh, makes the BRI so attractive for Beijing no it, it's a question of the availability of uh, funds for development 
which many countries have taken to achieve, it's, they, they have a problem of satisfying their in, infrastructure needs. Remember that no one else gives that money. Especially with African countries, this is the only hope they have. And they have a longer way to go than any of us. So they depend on it. But let's say even in Sri Lanka, we have Japanese aid and Chinese aid. Now when a government comes in, we'll negotiate with both. We know Chinese aid comes first. So you can get one project up uh, and away before the elections. The uh, Japanese aids come later, it's, it's, uh, I mean, they, they plan it out much better. So we just start that off before election. So when it comes to the election cycles, you need both. And China to show that you've done something and Japan to show there's more to follow. And hopefully if the voters follow it, you get elected, otherwise you're not. But it, this, is, this, is, this is a political formula that many countries use. You're looking at the glass half full. There's, yeah, there's something yeah. else that follows after the aid comes. Both will be, the you know, Japanese will be there before the fourth year, but they'll take a little bit longer than China. And it's, it's different types of projects also. And how the Japanese, they plan, they are very thorough. They plan every detail. Mm -hmm. China's also hinted at expanding the China-Myanmar economic uh, corridor to include Sri Lanka. Is that something that you're keen on? Well, yes, China-Myanmar economic corridor. To Sri Lanka and from Sri Lanka to Africa. You want to join it? Pardon? Does Sri Lanka want to join it? Well, the corridor is there and we'll, we'll get connected. There are no special program on that. But connectivity, yes, we are for connectivity. Also, we are for connectivity with the ports in Africa. Mm -hmm. So, we will connect both the ports in Africa and the Myanmar ports. But what's, what's, what's the issue of Myanmar port? Nothing. China wants to include you in one more project. I wanted to know if you are, uh, if you welcome it's, that. It's, it's not China. I mean, we are looking at getting integrated and we feel that the African ports are going to be important. I mean, even India knows that. We want to get linked up and for, yes. And if you link it up with the Myanmar, but the ships that come from Myanmar, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a new route altogether. That was anyway going to happen. Yeah. And ships have been coming to, to huh? Sri Lanka as well. Two, two ships came from China in the last one year to but Sri Lanka. But why are you asking me? I mean... No, no, yeah. no. My question is yes. that those two ships came and the US and India expressed concern and uh, experts said that they were spy ships. Is that a characterization I, you, you know, agree first, with? First one we asked for evidence it's a spy ship. There was no evidence. Mm -hmm. Second one we had allowed it. We allowed the ship to come. And they were in this area. It was not an issue at all. What is a spy ship is, is a big um, question mark. These are civilian ships, but if there are issues, if they are spy ships, we will not allow them to come in. But as far as exploration is concerned, we allow not only Chinese ships, but other ships. But no one highlights the fact that other ships also come to Sri Lanka. Each, each time a Chinese ship comes, we get a lot of publicity. But if a ship, a research ship comes from another country, we are ignored. For example? Hmm? They, 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 they come in. There's a friendship due. So, so we are going to now develop our own yeah. hydrography unit mm -hmm. and get our own ships. Then we can do surveys in, around India and China both. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> but in the meantime, would you welcome more such research ships from China or would you yeah, want we, Beijing to stop sending no, we'll them? In, we will welcome any research ship. We have no problems at all, as long as it's for research. Would you allow China uh, to also uh, dock a military ship in Sri Lanka? We have always allowed. All ships, military ships from any country, they are all docking in Colombo. So you are okay with that? Well, they have all been doing, Indians, Chinese, Russians, Americans, everyone comes to Colombo. Hamban thought we find the Japanese are not going there. No Chinese ship has gone so far. Do you feel that Sri Lanka is caught in the great power battle between India and China? There's a great power battle between not only India and China, between China and US though. India and all is part uh, is, is a part of that. India is worried about its own security and we have said if there are anything that affects India's national security, we feel so, we, we will certainly act. Uh, but let's talk about India's role in Sri Lanka's economic crisis. India helped us certainly uh, with the money they gave us. No, no two questions about it. Especially Mrs. Uh, Sitaraman was very, very helpful to us. Prime Minister was open. 
Mr. Jai Shankar mm-hmm. was also who was running. You've been in leadership roles since the 1990s and the India-Sri Lanka relationship has had its tough moments and good times. Do you think that the relationship is better now uh, than it was some decades ago? From 77, I've been in politics. Right. I first dealt with uh, the government of Moraji Desai and Mr. Vajpayee. Mm-hmm. We got on very well. I got to know Mr. Vajpayee in 1974 mm-hmm. before he became a guest of the Indian government for some time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got on then under mrs gandhi it was more strained <coughs> but i must say rajiv resolved the issues and uh, from there onwards we had really uh, fair good good relationship with the country with the country especially with with mr narasingha rao i was he and i were contemporaries in the education ministry so i knew him well and even after retire when he retired as to speak to him and get his advice on politics mm-hmm. then uh, we had mr gujral who again we knew and mr vajpayee and manmohan singh is one and what sort of equation do you share with the current prime minister of india mr modi i have known him for a long time when he was originally a chief minister mm-hmm. i know mr modi from that time onwards once i went to gujarat when he was chief minister the leader of the opposition and i was able to be there so i i have known him well like that the prime minister right you met him in july this year what was the conversation like basically in the sri lanka relations and how we go ahead after the crisis mm-hmm. so we had this vision statement which i think is a step forward so i'm surprised everyone is asking about the chinese ship is to ask him when are we going to develop trincomalee together uh, what are the connectivity in power connectivity the land connectivity the shipping connectivity none of those is question it's only one i was, was going to come to that so you only, might only, as well only, <laughs> one one tiny ship which comes out two weeks maybe it is an important subject but yes about the connectivity what what were the big takeaways from that meeting in it no we decided to go into close economic relations indian investments in uh, sri lanka trade further trade liberalization but more than that i mean it basically means indians will come into sri lanka they can invest here their tourists will the tourists will come in here Ch- uh, indians investing here in the uh, south port mm-hmm. west terminal we are looking at uh, fair amount of investments on renewable energy and the development of uh, the trinco port we'd like to develop it the this is then tourism so we we've had a fair I, i think the plate is full if you look at the state right so. uh, you attended the inauguration ceremony of mohammed muizu the new uh, president of the maldives yes. and on the very same day he asked india to withdraw troops from his country what do you make of his india out campaign no mr the uh, indian troops leaving maldives was a part of the uh, manifesto mm-hmm. of the present president mm-hmm. so as usual i presume when he made his first speech he asked for the he said he was going to fulfill his uh, i will listen to it fulfill his requirement of uh, require, promise to get foreign troops out of maldives i he will uh, i was not surprised that he said that but that have been a, one of the main items on his campaign i have not discussed that with him mm-hmm. this is my assessment of it do you think this is the right policy decision well for them it is something on which he got elected i didn't get elected on that no i understand but so, you're a, you, you're a veteran of strategic choices you've seen south asian politics yeah but <laughs> they they made the choice but i was looking at the other way i i do i think uh, india should not uh, get too worried about it I I I I would say that you should focus more on strengthening our relationships with Maldives that is the only you I have India should not uh, because of this incident uh, abandon Maldives I think Maldives needs their help and that's what I understood from the discussions I had with the president that he needs the help of India He said that to you that he needs the help of India He said he needs the help of India But you did not advise him on this India out policy no i mean he 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 announced it before i met him what would you have told him otherwise i would have told him 
do it slowly. Mm -hmm. He might still do it slowly, I mean, the fact that he is not going to get it and have do it after discussion. Let's talk about the Easter bombings. There's been a mm -hmm. lot of talk about it and uh, even some allegations of collusion by former government officials. Uh, you were asked about it uh, recently and you looked visibly agitated. Do you think there is an attempt uh, to to undermine Sri Lanka's investigation and findings into these attacks? And if yes, then by whom? No, I have given the church the mm -hmm, commission report and the commission report and all the other papers. I think it goes into a, about 20 or 30,000 pages. So when they study that, I said to come back, we will have a discussion. You know, they've written a letter to Australia. They've called on Australia to build pressure on your own government. The Who head of the, the head of the Catholic Church. Pardon? The head of the Catholic Church in Sri Lanka. No, I don't think Australians are going to do it, whoever wrote it. Who's the head of the Catholic Church? I don't, I don't have the name, but I can quote from what they've said. Okay. Yeah. They said, we want the Australian government and also many governments in the world to consider this as a serious human rights violation, violation of the dignity of human beings and serious suspicions of a political plot appearing. As far as I am concerned, I have given them the commission report and the evidence and let them study that and come back. Then we can discuss it further. The opposition... But, ha hmm? Yes, please. The, at that time I was Prime Minister and the foreign intelligence services said that it was a local. Hmm. I remember Thank talking you. to you right after that as yeah, well. Yeah, that's so. But let them look at the uh, this and then come back. I don't think Australia or anyone will get involved till they look at it. If Australian government wants or anyone else wants, I will give them 30,000 or 40,000 pages of the Commission. The opposition says that you made an earlier pledge to let Scotland Yard investigate the 2019 attacks and you've gone back on it. I got them down. I said I'm used to. But let them all first look at this uh, report. Everyone is making politics out of it. Study the report. And then tell us. Eleven Indians also died in those attacks. Have you kept New Delhi uh, updated about uh, the investigation? New Delhi knew because your people were here for the investigation and they filed the report there. Mm -hmm. After all, New Delhi informed us so they know well what happened. You also spoke about the situation in Gaza recently and you accused Western leaders or Western countries of double standards when it comes to human rights. Why did you say that? Well, look at it. I mean, they lecture to us. Mm -hmm. one, of the, uh, one of the conditions put on us that we should speak with the Muslims. So I am speaking with the Muslims, they are not speaking with the Muslims. But let's, let's uh, look at it. There has to be a ceasefire in uh, Gaza. There are no two questions. Mm -hmm. So how can we ignore it? That is my issue. I mean, not only me. Everyone thinks that uh, double stand, actually the division between the South and the North, uh, north, or I must say south and the west, mm -hmm. global side, it's grown because of this. I mean, you can't justify this. Fifteen, sixteen thousand people, and forget about us, there are demonstrations in Israel because they think they should focus first on hostages. They say that uh, the Hamas uses civilian infrastructure and civilians as human shields, and that's the only way to take them out, and that is Israel's justification uh, for the civilian casualties. Uh, how do you think Israel should have and then gone What did they tell us at the end of the war? What did they tell us when they ended the war in 2009? What did they tell you? I mean, basically, we were condemned, no? I think, finally. Mm -hmm. I was not the government, President Rajapaksa. But uh, all they talk of human rights thereafter also, have they followed it here? Basically, the world has uh, seen double standards. I have to agree with that. Hmm? I have to agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Tamil reconciliation is a major challenge for any Sri Lankan government, especially the question of Tamil autonomy. You did make an offer, but you did not give police powers, and the Tamil parties rejected it. Did you not think that such an offer would be dead on arrival? My, my offer has been accepted by most Tamils and most Tamil MPs. Tamil parties are divided. I started working out the re return of the lands which have now been taken over by the Department of Forests and the Department of Wildlife. So we've said whatever, we will all go by the 1985 map. Now negotiations are on between the MPs, Forest Department, the District Administrators. Uh, 
So this is one of the major issues that have come up. We have no problem. We've just started on this and I'm discussing with the MPs. After this budget is over, the next round will come. In September this year, India criticized uh, Sri Lanka's uh, record on, on the Tamils and uh, it told the UN Human Rights Council, and I'm quoting, progress has been inadequate. Do you agree? I, I don't agree with it. I'm surprised they said that. Mm -hmm. We have seen the progress we have made in the last year. And the Tamil MPs and the Tamils are one of it. We have for the first time gone in now. There are shortcomings. They are still haven't reached the same level as others. The cities, they are all right, but in the rural areas, and that's the whole integration policy. You must, both, uh, all, all groups must have the same facilities in that area. So if you're in a distance rural area, everyone has the same facilities. But none of the communities could expect to have the facilities that's available in the district uh, uh, administrative center. We have to raise it later. And uh, we'll be giving lands to the Tamils. I, 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 in, in fact, uh, today the renewable energy is in the north. So the north in the next 10 years will be a very rich province. So I was surprised of India and these things. But, uh, India is uh, heading for an election next year. Yeah. Uh, who do you think stands a better chance? I must ask that from you. No, I'm uh, sure you've been reading what's the, the I'm situation. I'm reading, I'm following it. Let's see what the provincial, the state elections say. But the national elections, what I'm talking about. Yeah, state elections will give a... BJP has advantage in it's a single party that's led by a single leader. Uh, opposition has still not got together. Mm -hmm. If they do have arrangements, then you have to judge it separately from what it is today. What suits Colombo better? Continuity or change? Sri Lanka has to deal with what happens in India. I always say you should have been a diplomat, but you're a politician. Uh, let's talk about your political future, sir. Uh, there is a president, presidential election next year in your country as well. Are you going to contest? My first job is to put the economy into shape. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes or a no? That means my first job is to put the economy in shape. Get, get it functioning. Thereafter, I can decide what I want to do. If you can't, I might even become a correspondent like you going around. <laughs> Will you take me onto platform one? You're most welcome, sir. We can <laughs> okay. learn a thing or two from you, I'm sure. Uh, but if you do contest, uh, would you consider taking support or aligning with the Rajapaksas or their party or whatever section of the party that is supporting you? Pardon? Would you take support from the Rajapaksas or align with them if you continue? Well, at the moment, though I belong to the UNP, I am functioning as a president without taking party alignment. Mm -hmm. Then the question is whether I should come as a party alignment if I do take a question. Since I haven't decided, what, what does it matter? It doesn't. Let's talk about cricket. Mm. Uh, we've just concluded a World Cup. Uh, the Sri Lankan mm. team did not have a very good showing. But did you watch some of the matches? I watched some of the matches. Not fully, mm -hmm. but no. More than the game, it's the politics that is that is bothersome. Um, there's a lot that has happened. Uh, the the sports minister of Sri Lanka dismissed the board. The courts reinstated it. Then the ICC suspended it. Then the opposition leader, one opposition leader, has written a letter to Parliament saying that the uh, the board has said that the uh, told the ICC that there is political interference and so on and so forth. So my question is, what really is happening in Sri Lankan politics? The opposition has said that the uh, Board of Control has written to the ICC and said to suspend Sri Lanka. And uh, that one, the leader of the opposition gave me the set of letters. I haven't looked at it yet. But ICC was anyway going to suspend Sri Lanka. I knew that. We were trying to save the uh, under-19 matches. We were going to have tourism. But it, that didn't work out, so we've lost on all that. I am waiting to see the outcome of the decision of the courts in regard to the interim committee. And once that is done, we'll have to start talking with the um, ICC to restore the, uh, to ensure that Sri Lanka can host matches again. As far as the cricket uh, board is concerned, there's a committee of ministers that are going to it and which will recommend legislation, they've spoken to the board members uh, as well as to the interim committee uh, members. But I want to bring legislation 
which will take away the power of the minister to intervene and interfere in politics. That's been there from 73. That has to change. And there's a new law, draft law, that's been prepared. Is Jay Shah running Sri Lankan cricket? No, Jay Shah doesn't run Sri Lankan cricket. So why is he being dragged into it? They think that Jay Shah is supporting the cricket board. But I spoke to Jay Shah, I felt sorry that his name had been dragged in, I apologize. And he said, my position, if, if there's a, whoever is the legal body, I will back. If this, this lot is the legal body, I will back them. If the other lot is the legal body, I will back them. If there's a third group that's the legal body, I back them. That's not decided by me. That's decided by ICC. President Vikram Singhi, you're a man of books. Um, and when your, when your house came under attack last year, some of those books uh, were also burnt, and you said that they were your biggest wealth. Uh, in these times of social media and hyper-polarization and hyper-connectivity, uh, how do you view politics in times like these? Are, these? are these some of the trends that worry you or do you think that you have to move with the times? Some of it worries me. The, media, the social media, the attacks on people, most of it that's uh, not true. The ability to rouse crowds, whether it's on religion or cricket or anything. I mean, these, we have to seriously rethink of it. But also, it's, now it's becoming the politics of the 21st uh, century, of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. It's quite different. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure as always to Thank talk you. to you and for your patience and taking all the questions that we had. Well, thank you for interviewing me. Thank you, sir. Okay.